Hey folks, it's Maxi here and welcome to a new TW2020 video. You join us for the new event in February, which I've decided to call AEW The Romance is Dead, because obviously second week of February it would tie in line with St Valentine's Day. I just felt like with regards to Forbidden Door, we're in a, in a position where most of the, the, the over New Japan guys are either with us, or they've already, you know, they're past the physical decline, so there's no real value in bringing them in. But it gives us an opportunity to have a February event before we then kick into the All Women's event coming up shortly. And uh, we'll have that big 100-seater show in March when we make it free entry. I've yet to decide the name on it. There will be some matches that will be booked towards that with an uh, insert name of event. Uh, I'd just like to say as well, apologies for the last couple of episodes. I think it's been just the, the transition to... The way I stream or record the TW videos is you have to have it in like a special resolution with regards to, to OBS Studio and I didn't quite have it set correctly, which I didn't notice until obviously it's, you only got one take at a, a TW video, you're struggling just the way it is with the game. So I didn't realise until I was uh, editing, I'm like, oh well, I can't get the footage again, so we uh, um, obviously have to... Make sure that doesn't happen again. It seems to be fine. I've done a wee pre-record just to make sure everything looked all dandy and from his on screen. So hopefully, it's a good show. It's only been two weeks in-game since the last event. But there's been, obviously, two of each show. And I've had the, the full tapings of um, Impact as well. So it's try to keep storylines flowing. But I'm quite happy with how the show's panned out. It, it looks pretty encouraging. I say a lot of storylines carry on. So without further ado... Here is AW, the romance is dead. So here we are, we're in MetLife Stadium. It's amazing the fact we're at a stage where we could just casually book a, a pay-per-view in MetLife Stadium, but 77,000 in attendance. And I wanted to kind of make sure we got the 100 segment, but I wanted to make sure it built to something. So in the last couple of months especially, I've, I've probably used both guys very, very sparingly, admittedly, but I felt like here... It was a good opportunity to kind of to get Punk out the door, as it seems is the case pretty much in real life. Truthfully, in game he's very over, but he's a massive physical decline, so he's only really valuable in promos. The contract's got seven months to go, so we may embark on a little storyline that says CM Punk take his ball and go home. So this promo, we start with CM Punk in the ring on his own, and he just says it's fitting. It's another month, it's another pay-per-view, no CM Punk on the card. So I'm out here to air some grievances. I firmly believe I'm still the best in the world. And I sure as hell could beat most of this roster. I admit there'll be some, maybe a bit tough. The world champion water's a bit difficult. But I definitely feel there's a lot of people I can beat here. And I still want to prove I'm one of the best in the world. And nobody's going to stop me. Miro's music hits. And it says, that nah, I know what you mean. I've also been someone that's probably not been used as, as great as I should have been. But let's talk about you being the best in the world. Remember at one point, I was the best man. And if, if you think you're the best in the world, then I think I'm the best man to kick your ass and send you packing from AW. Because forget, Miro's full on baby face here. So they have just a lot of verbals against each other. But it's pretty much making sure and setting up at the March event, CM Punk versus Miro. I don't want to make it if CM Punk loses, then he's out because I might put Miro over to get the overness on him. And Punk can maybe go on a losing streak before he exits. But it gives me the cheap 100 segment and um, Punk versus Miro build up for the future. Our opening contest was about to have superb wrestling and good heat. Pack defeated Andrade Elidolo in 1954 with a black arrow. 82. We had to protect Andrade here, he wasn't too comfortable in putting Pack over. I'm in the midst of putting Pac on like a, a run, of, of trying to get him over, I just feel like it's one opportunity, to, he's, he's always a solid hand, the promo skills are maybe not quite there, but the in-ring stuff is still getting you great ratings, so I feel like Andrade is someone that, in this mod especially, can carry a promo, so it's not, wins and losses don't really matter for him, he can build him up pretty quickly, so Pac takes a win, we had to keep that Andrade a little bit strong, which is why we get an 82 for our rating. And just to prove, uh, case in point, Pack cuts a promo just saying there's another message sent from the bastard Pack, and it's only a 69. So promo skills are a lot to leave desired, but you know every single time that Pack is going to bring it in the ring. 
Next up, at the bout for the TBS Championship. Now, this one was kind of last second booking, but I felt like with the way that Yuka was going in Carnage, she was defending that Queen of AW Championship like nothing else, and I felt like she was too good to be there. So I wanted to have her like have a great match up here and um, really cement herself as one of the top women in the division, never mind carrying Carnage. I'm not going to cry it, is the fact I've just saw their in-ring performances and I've saw they've had great chemistry, which I didn't know, and um, the psychology has hampered it. So if we take a little look here, it was about they had superb wrestling and good heat. Kyrie defends the belt against Yuka. She gets the win in 14-22 with a spear. Seventh defense of the belt. 82. They bring a 95 and a 92 performance. That's far surpassed any of my expectations. The only negative is the lack of psychology, which obviously would probably hit that down for about an 88-87. So... Kyrie is like maybe one, two points off carrying a match. She probably could maybe at a 79. I feel that's kind of like that threshold is sometimes they'll be able to carry it. But sometimes it can drift. But I was hoping the fact this was only 14 minutes. I think I made that steal the show. I made quite a few of them to try and get the good ratings. So if we can get a wee bit of development, these ladies, and I mean, you had an Io Shirai, etc. And that's not even our main event scene. It's crazy. So this one will take a bit of explaining. So, Veronica is basically a generated wrestler who has very poor stats, technically, very high psychology, very high sex appeal, very high charisma. She has like everything you want in terms of on the mic, but in ring, very, very, very suspect. So I'm trying to see how over I can get her with just doing promos. But at the same time, putting her in with people that can help carry her so she can still have good matches. So, The Rock isn't the most over in this. He, had, uh, he was caught, I think, with drugs and he took a massive toxic hit and was down to like 70 over. We've got him in. We've got Austin in. So I'm just doing promos with them, promoting stuff, and Veronica's in with them. But the, the, the point of this promo was basically Ruby Soho comes out, she says she's sick of Veronica taking up time for the women's athletes to develop and train and perform, and she wants to teach her a lesson. The reality is, it's an experienced hand that can give Veronica a good match and help her skill set develop. Because most of them are like 19, 18, but they're starting to creep over the 20s. So I feel Ruby's someone that could definitely carry that. So 85, you can see there Veronica can hang with the promo. Ruby was underwhelming. It's an opportunity to help develop. So overall, very happy with that. And obviously that match will take place on our next show, which is the All Women Show. Which, um, what do we call it? The Star So Shine. There we go. Try to change everything name-wise. So if you joined us for the last episode, you realised that Jamie Hayter lost to Elena Black via disqualification. Or count-out, I can't remember, but it was a dusty finish anyway. So rematch, and let's do it within the confines of a steel cage. And there's a good match-up that saw Jamie Hayter defeat Elena Black in the cage match in 1429 when Jamie Hayter escaped. She wins the Shine Championship. So in 80, I just want to try and get the prestige up of the belt a little bit. Because obviously coming from Shane, it's not the most over in terms of where our belts are. But Elena had a very, very good run with it. Obviously, the now known as Cora Jade. And I feel like there's certainly places I can take that character. And I feel like it doesn't necessarily at this moment in time need a championship belt. 80 overall was very good. And the colour commentary gave it a boost. And after a wee celebration, haters going to hate. But your Shane champion, Jimmy Hater, 78. Next up, we had a bout that had superb wrestling and great heat. And this continues on with a feud that's been growing basically between, obviously, the Super Elite and they've been having issues with Ricky Starks. But Darby Allen's been kind of getting his nose in and stuff like that. He's been, you know, distracting Adam Cole and getting in Adam Cole's head. So the opportunity here was to have them in a matchup for the IWGP US Championship, which I have on Darby Allen. So I said, superb, great heat. Darby defeats Adam Cole in 2059 with the coffin drop, and Darby makes the eighth defence of the IWGP United States Championship. So this is an 88. These two have great chemistry together. I, I did run it on Dynamite once to test it, and it done well. Both of them, in terms of their psychology stat, is in that kind of threshold at 80, so they can sometimes carry it. So again, it's maybe a, you're lucky the draw whether you get it or not, but I feel like if these two can get just a couple more psychology points for just working and working and working and developing that skill 
every reason this match could be a 90, because these guys are putting on a clinic. And after it, he's defeated most people in the Super Elite, but not Jay White. Little tease for Darby Allen, Jay White, which will probably take place on that big show that we're aiming for 100,000 crowd. 87. Then we have backstage, obviously we've had a lot of issues between FTR, we've had them with Tyler Black and John Moxley, we've had them with Kevin Steen and Nick Jackson from the Super Elite. Mox is in a match against Kevin Steen next. Tyler Black's just minding his own business. He's obviously still suffering a little bit of injury from previous attacks. And the FTR have taken out Tyler Black. So obviously Mox is ready for his entrance, he's none the wiser. But yeah, no help at hand for Tyler Black and it's a 76 for this angle. I hope you like beatdowns because there's a lot tonight. We have the matchup between Steen and John Moxley and I had superb wrestling and great heat. Steen defeats Moxley in 2004 with a handful of the tights. I feel Steen needs a bit more overness which is why I put him over Moxley. Moxley can talk his way into overness. So it was a good matchup. It continues the feud between that portion of the Super Elite and Moxley and Tyler Black and continues them kind of messing about in the tag team division to an extent. So 86 and a good win for Kevin Steen. Next up, Kev, eh, say Kevin, Kingston. Eddie Kingston cuts a promo on Swerve. They obviously done battle at our last event, but this one has a stipulation. It's a tailored match. And he just says, I'm, I'm just tired. I'm, I'm fed up with this fake gangster persona. I'm just going to end you. I'm just going to put you through a table. Done. I can move on. This was a waste of time, but hey, if we need to get beat up, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So, 67, naturally, and about they had great heat and good wrestling, Swerve defeats Eddie Kingston in a tables match in 14.04 when Eddie was put through a table. I think with these two to click, it would probably be a better programme. Rolls reversed, Swerve is a heel, Eddie's a babyface, but in this instance, I've given Swerve the win. There's a lot of people I want to push at the moment. Swerve's one of them. There's two others that I'll mention over the course of the show. They're pop capped and it's very frustrating because I know they could make it to the top. But the game's going to limit where they are and I need them to get there more so through promos and in-ring, effectively, rather than popularity. But we'll touch on that when we get to them. Next up, a little few that's been happening on the Carnage brand and that is Aussie Open by Osprey United Empire. have had a lot of issues with Cody Rhodes. Obviously, there's a big history between Will Ospreay and Ricochet and Cody Rhodes' his protege, of course, the son of William Regal, Bailey Matthews. And this one, it was a good matchup. Will Ospreay and Aussie Open defeat Cody Rhodes, Ricochet and Bailey Matthews in 14-13. Will Ospreay with the Oscar and Bailey Matthews. So it's it's really the Carnage brand. Cody practically main events every time just to make sure the brand doesn't lose pop because I keep it as an A show, but it allows me to develop them. If they're too high for TDF, they're too high for Impact, but they're not quite over enough for Carnage or Rampage, eh, Rampage or Dynamite, but I don't have a, even if I don't have a programme for them. So I can do a lot of development there. And uh, Cody's in the main event, like even ahead of the champion, Shota. I don't know, but overall, 81, pretty good. Now, you know with the programme before? Well, Cody's been dragged back in here. He's beat down after the matchup. By those two guys that just talk and talk and talk. That is, of course, Logan Paul and Matty Wahlberg. And their new muscle that throws Cody from here to there to the other side of the earth. And that is the man they call Hook. I also had a hilarious one where Hook popped in and said, uh, I feel like such and such as whatever. So uh, the fact that he's, he's offering opinions mean that he's one of the locker room leaders, I think. Which is quite mental. But 84, good stuff there. It's only going to help the popularity of Wahlberg and Hook, Logan Paul. Already over. Next up, we had that matchup that we've been brewing for a while for the TNT Championship. Of course, Kinoski Kinoski Takesh, I can never get his first name right, uh, defeats Daniel Garcia in a technical masterclass in 23 25 with a touchdown. New TNT Champion. 81 overall. I made this a technical masterclass. The program, if you haven't been following, was basically Takesh defeated Daniel, uh, Brian Danielson, which enabled him to take on. Brian's protege, which is Daniel Garcia. The irony of compared to where they're in real life, but that gave him the matchup. He's won this, he's now the champion, and he can reign in the TNT division. However, we've got Brian Danielson, we've got Daniel Garcia, they're not happy. So the third man comes in 
and that man is going to be Daniel Bryant. I legit knew Jen that spawned, um, and I felt with the name it was perfect to bring him in with Danielson and Garcia. But Takeshita celebrating in the ring, Danielson, Garcia, and Bryant running and attack him, beating Takeshita down to the mat. So a 69, um, both men, eh, sorry, Bryant underperformed. Both men are still single heel f- face turns. They are going to turn face eventually. Um, so the, this alliance will be short lived, but I need to work out how I'm going to go from here to there. But I can give a rough idea. Um, I haven't decided yet with face I was going to go with Bryant, so we'll keep him as, as, as masked at the moment, just unknown, but he'll have a face by the time we are at the next event, because hopefully this programme will have uh, carried on and moved on quite significantly. But 69, nonetheless. I still have absolute Ricky Starks is taking on Kenny Omega, and he just says some words. He says, it's been good, it's been fun uh, to wind up the Super Elite and tonight he's going to show he absolutely deserves to be in the main event when he defeats Kenny Omega. 77. And match itself. Fantastic heat and great wrestling. Kenny Omega defeats Ricky Starks in 21.52 with a one-winged angel. I'd love to put Ricky over Kenny, but I just feel he's very restricted by the game, which is a shame, and I don't feel he's going to make it to the top level. I think his peak is probably going to be upper mid card which is frustrating because uh, I really think main event are every day of the week but alas here we are so Kenny picks up the win with the one winged angel 81 and he gets a bit more heat for the super elite next up Britt Baker and Anna Jay are cutting a promo as they are going to take on Mayu Iwatani and Mercedes KV or Mercedes Vernado it's a case of they're challenging for the Women's Tag Team Championships, which is a bit ironic because, you know, they are going to be facing each other in two weeks' time at that all-women's event. It's our time to shine. So while they coexist, then Britt and Anna just mock them and say absolutely no chance. So 79 for the promo. And the matchup was superb as Mayu Iwatani and Mercedes Vernado defeat Britt Baker and Anna J. In 1823, when Mayu pinned Anna Jay with a dragon suplex, meaning they are the AEW World Tag Champions. 81, both of the, the heels here only for 75 performances. Mercedes win 88, and Atwa- uh, Iwatani win 90. I've kind of went like Batista and, was it Batista and Undertaker or Shawn Michaels and Cena would have put them obviously as tag champs just before they're going to face each other. Not really ideal considering we've got an all women's event, but it means they can have like a multi women tag match that can crown number one contenders. Well, these two obviously will do a battle in the main event. And uh, Britt Baker has debuted in a power spot that showcased her ability to sell. Her psychology has been helped. Good, good, good. And the stare down by the two tag team champions there, 86. So that is going to be your main event for the all women's event. Iwatani Vernado Women's Championship on the line. So we've got two matches announced for that so far, but plenty I can make up in the next two weeks. That's two weeks away, there we go, the stars who shine, the fourth week, but alright. Which I think leads us to our main event. Get ready for a shock, I'm taking a massive risk here. And about that was for the AEW World Championship, and was also for the Lucha Underground Championship. Walter took on Jungle Boy. Walter basically destroyed Shinsuke Nakamura, powerbombed him through a table. He's out of the company, his contract was up anyway. Jungle Boy took exception. Jungle Boy stood up for him, and Paul just said, I'm going to absolutely squash you. So here, they put the two titles on the line, Jungle Boy versus Walter, and it was a superb wrestling match with great heat, as Jungle Boy defeated Walter in 23-11 by pinfall with a Canadian Destroyer. God knows how he's pulled that one off. But he wins the World Championship, so Jungle Boy is now someone who has a double champion. He's my world champion and he makes the defence of the Lucha Underground title for the fourth time. Jungle Boy's pop cap, it was a promise by Walter that I felt like I will utilise. And it's good to see they have good chemistry together which did lift the match. Was maybe hoping for a bit better than an 85, but still stellar stuff here. And obviously after the matchup, Walter gets really, really angry and he beats the living hell out of Jungle Boy, which is an 80 rated segment. So somehow, 
maybe I've done a Vince Russo and just went panic one went right we put championship on Jungle Boy but I've got an idea where I want to go with Jungle Boy and where the championship's going to go all the way up to probably I double nothing at least in the next couple of months they're like I don't see it being a long title reign but we'll see what we can work with and I want to take that risk of somebody not as over carrying the belt so the show itself 95, increase of popularity in two regions. We ended up with a couple of double champions, a new Shine champion, and is it my best work? Maybe not. Possibly is. New tag champs, but yeah, new TNT champ. But overall, I'm quite happy with, with how it's ended up and where we go for here. So, pretty decent. I'll just confirm now. So, the next video is the Shine, is uh, our time of Shine, the All Women's event. After that, I think it is our free show, the 100,000 seater show, which we're going to call David Vertis Goliath. So you know which your event is going to be the main event, or obviously be the rematch for the EW World title. Jungle Boy versus Walter. I'm going to try and phase Jungle Boy into Jack Perry as well in that time. And uh, after that, we'll have the next Impact event, which I'm not too sure what it's called, but I've got it all ready to go for you twice. So yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very much for watching. Let us know what you thought. Let us know how you feel about people that are popcap becoming your major champion. Does it frustrate you when people get popcap? Do you feel it's realistic? Because there's some people that can just boom with popularity or you can get something like a Tony Nese where it's just like you feel there's like a cap they're never going to reach a certain level despite how talented they may be. So let me know your thoughts on that. But until next time, thanks for watching and I'll see you for the All Women's event in our next video next week. Take it easy. Bye-bye.